Welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. We're going to continue our interview with Thomas Drake, whistleblower, former senior uh, executive, I guess you could say, or officer at the NSA, and also someone who stuck his neck out. Got be very concerned about the role the NSA played, both in not preventing 9-11, which he says they could have, and not revealing the NSA secretly uh, developing a mass surveillance state, which he then helped to expose, and other things. Uh, he's a man who stuck his neck out. Thanks for joining us. So, in, a, in part one, we talked about how deliberate this process is, uh, and, and the question of how much of this is lack of prioritization, and by this I mean the suppression, withholding of evidence that various intelligence agencies gathered prior to 9-11 that might have prevented 9-11. And uh, you know, one of the things that is easiest to focus on, because there's other examples as well, but this one of these guys in San Diego, um, two guys that FBI know were there, CIA know were there, NSA know were there. Um, and and in, in a report or a, me a public memorandum that you and some of your colleagues sent to uh, President Obama in 2014 titled NSA Insiders Reveal What Went Wrong, um, in relating the NSA, the statement says this. Was it a case of gross ineptitude on NSA's part, or was NSA deliberately withholding information linking El Mindar to the known Al Qaeda base in Yemen? I mean, what you're suggesting it could have been deliberate. What would it? Why would they do it? You have to understand. I want to come back to this, and something and some of it's fully appreciated because it's easy to say it was deliberate. It's easy to say they withheld it on purpose. It's easy to say they knew this and didn't share it. Counterterrorism NSA was not a priority at all. It just wasn't. The office that even dealt with it was, was a backwater office of about 20 people. I used to work extensively with them, particularly after 9-11. They themselves complained about all the reports that they had been issuing for years and years and years, largely in response to the tenant memo, the systems brinkling red, all the way back to 1998, would continually, continuously fall in deaf ears. But the Clinton presidency, took it seriously enough to appoint Richard Clark to pra essentially a cabinet level position. I mean, that's taking terrorism seriously. Well, it's the Bush of presidency that demotes him. Yeah, because Cheney didn't trust Clark at all. So why not replace him and have someone else at the cabinet level? They, because it, it gets in the way and, and the potential that you know, he may say something out of turn. They, they didn't trust him. So if you can't control if you don't trust somebody, then obviously you, you don't believe you can control them. And you suggested, you said, not suggested in the last segment, that Cheney sets up his own back channels to get intelligence directly to he him. He basically created his all, with all the key leaders and then some all the way down into the bowels of each agency. So if the NSA isn't prioritizing terrorism, isn't that a decision not to prioritize it at a time when you're getting all this information saying there's such real threats? Yeah, but you're also getting staggering amounts of information. You gotta remember the, the part of the problem here was the glut of information. It, you were just getting flooded. I remember later the FBI even talking about this with me, even prior to 9-11, just st st staggering amounts of information coming in. How do you sort through it all? How do you make sense of it all? This is the great challenge NSA faced, one of the reasons I was hired. How do you make sense in a massive stream of data, basically oceans of data, how do you find the drops that matter? But and that was part of the challenge, but frankly. But Tennant says it's the highest priority facing the United States, so they've sifted through all this stuff and they've come to the Just conclusion. saying it's a priority doesn't mean you're actually gonna find what's of priority. That, that's, that's part of the disconnect here. Saying it is by virtue of what we knew at the time, but then actually finding those things to take, take action. Remember, intelligence fundamentally is about indications and warning. You have to have the indications, but then you have to report it as a warning. Those are tip-offs, those are alerting people. But if, okay, if you don't do that and the action's not taken, it doesn't matter if Tenet sits there all day claim, holler, hollering, the sky is falling when it actually is. I can keep my head buried in the sand for a long, long time because nothing has happened yet. Right, well, except some stuff had happened. Well, nothing had happened in the, quote unquote, the homeland. Well, they'd already attacked the World Trade Center, as you said in part one. I, that was sort of forgotten. I'm gonna keep after you here. No, that's okay. No, Cause, I've, cause it's, I'm, it's I'm, part of the contradiction. Because that's what I'm hearing from you, is, is this contradiction that it's a fundamental we can follow one line of conversation and you'll say, they let it happen. And then another one. It was convenient to let it happen. 
knowing something would happen, why would you actually want to make an effort to prevent it? Because by letting it happen, you would have your excuse. Cheney had made it clear, right, crystal clear, what he wanted to do was reestablish the authority of the president. And in Project for New American Surgery, they actually come out and say, you know, all the things we should be doing in term, terms of asserting U.S. military then political power in this new post-Soviet era, yes. we need a new Pearl Harbor because American public opinion has no taste for more war. That's why I said it was it. convenient to allow the course of events their due and whatever would happen would happen. Knowing something would happen, why would you want to stop it? That's why I'm saying the deprioritization is not unconscious. No, I would agree, it's not. But if you're at, at the NSA, you do have the dynamic of you're going to culturally not really, because it's not a priority. And remember, it was, all of this was a super close hold. The vast majority of NSA is not on the counterterrorism mission. They're doing all the traditional stuff. Same thing, Colleen Rowley I've interviewed, and maybe we'll link, <clears throat> link to her interview so you can find them as we're doing this. Um, she said in the interview, because I asked her a somewhat similar question, she said the FBI was specifically told don't prioritize terrorism by Cheney. There was actual instructions that this is not our, the priority of our administration, which is part of why she says they couldn't get the FBI's attention to really pay attention to what they had found in Minneapolis. That still doesn't matter, though. I realize there's, that's a huge factor in terms of saying it isn't, but you're obligated to, to, under the Constitution to provide for the common defense. If you have information that rises to a level that says something is happening and it's gonna be really bad, you gotta share it. You gotta get, bring in the key people. You gotta take action to prevent it. That's the whole point. Now, if you, I would have argued this, I've said this before, that whole process was subverted by Cheney and company. Okay, so the system, what I'm saying, the system itself was essentially set aside. The secret channels were the ones that were utilized. And, and they, knew, they knew much better than anybody else that something big was going to happen. They didn't actually know exact time or date. There's actually more than just passing evidence that they had wanted to do what, what ultimately happened much earlier. They just weren't able to make it all happen. Yeah, we, I agree. we know about all the test flights. We know about attempt, we know you have James Woods who uh, actually was interviewed. Uh, realizing that one of the flights he took, one of the many flights he took from the east to the west coast, he remembers certain people, right, of Middle Eastern descent who were on that, or those airplanes, or on those flights. It was clear that they had James spent Woods a long time, is. the actor, yeah, they knew they had spent a long time working this out, making observations, testing how secure, insecure our, our system, our airline in, in particular, and the now, secure, all the security mechanisms. Now, one of the things that has come out of, uh, came out of Bob Graham's joint congressional investigation is this famous 28 pages of their report. And the, essentially, Graham has, has acknowledged, and there's been press reports, that what are in these 28 pages is the evidence, evidence, they say, of direct Saudi role in financing and facilitating, and according to Graham, Saudi government role in financing and facilitating. Uh, yeah. if, this is a, if this is true, the NSA must be hearing this stuff. The, this is part of what the NSA must not be passing on. It's not just about the information in San Diego. They gotta know about the whole Saudi connection. Yeah, but that's, that's political. That's geopolitics at the highest level. You're not gonna counter the president when it comes to that, or the vice president for that matter. This is, you're talking, this is really serious stuff. You're talking about kind of the heart of dark government, what I call the double government. This is the other government in action. You set it up in a way that obviously uh, you're gonna protect the Saudis. And yes, this, clearly the Saudis had a huge, remember most of the hijackers came from Saudi Arabia. Remember, I can look, I can look this gift horse right in the mouth and say what is so. But that's what most people don't wanna do because it opens up some really disturbing questions about power and who we are and who's in charge. And, and when did you start asking yourself these particular kinds of questions? Oh, early on in my life. Early on. Yeah. I, early on, because of experience I had, never trust 
anybody in any position of power or authority because they're usually up to no good or they'll abuse their positions of power or authority. That's so why I wear a cue. It's question everything, especially authority. And, and why did you then work for so many years in the state, one form or another, in this dark state? It was serving my country. And it was, I'm in the system. People, there's a, there's a longer history. I, I actually blew the whistle when I was in the Air Force. Um, I blew the whistle when I was a contractor. Oh, oh on a, ma a major program at NSA called, called Minstrel. Something the FBI reminded me of. It says, yeah, we know about your whistleblowing of Minstrel. It was actually, it was supposed to modernize the voice processing, you know, bring it into the modern, modern era. So yes, it was serving my country, but you got to keep your, the secret government in check because it tends to abuse itself. We have too many incidents. I mean, you can go back to the Gulf of Tonkin where you deliberately manipulated, actually created and framed the intelligence to make it look like the North Vietnamese had actually attacked when they hadn't. And of course, that was the excuse that Johnson needed to expand the war, right? What a disaster that was. Nixon torpedoing the uh, Johnson's negotiation with the North That's Vietnamese. That's a whole other one. Uh, if you're interested in that one, we have an interview uh, about that where we actually play the, the tapes that the Johnson Library uh, released where he accused Nixon of acting like a traitor and said 50,000 more American boys' lives are going to be on, on, on your head. Um, Nixon ignored him. And knew See, this is all history that burdens me, okay? This is why I try not to get too cynical about the human condition. I'm well aware of what happens in history. You know, I'm well aware of secret agreements, you know, both in World War I and World War II that were triggered, right? Because, hey, or violated, and then things are unleashed, right? I mean, this is not, this is not pleasant stuff for people to look at. Most people don't want to look at the Pandora's box of history because it's not pleasant. It just isn't. And so you, you have enormous power. People, the power is, is pathological when you start using it for other purposes. Power itself, Lord Acton's right, does, does tend to corrupt. It doesn't mean it always corrupts, but it tends to, because most people cannot resist the siren call of what it can do to, for you. When you talk about disturbing dark questions and the heart of this dark state, um, the, the, do you think that's one of the reasons that, that what the NSA knew pre-9-11 more wasn't done on? Because it led, leads to the Saudis, if Graham's commission's right. In part it does, but they're also caught up at even the higher levels of, of the government. And it's not just NSA, but NSA is a secret military intelligence agency. It was signed, it was signed into being by virtue of a, of a stroke of a pen by President Truman. It was never legislated um, into existence. It was secret. Military intelligence, we gotta, gotta be real here about what that agency does. It's headed by now a four-star general. You know, that's, that's a military order, that's a military rule. That's, you know, it's not led by a civilian. It reports up through the Department of Defense, historically. Now we got the DNI. Um, NSA routinely broke US laws even prior to the 1970s. That all came out, much of it came out, not all of it, in the church and Pike committees, even the Rockefeller uh, Commission, right? And none of that, that's, yeah, that's, I could argue that NSA has broken the law for most of its history. It's, remember, it was foreign intelligence. You were designed to break, it didn't matter what the rules were or the laws of any respective country. You were going to collect whatever you needed to collect for the purposes of national security. And national security uh, is the purview of the president. So again, that's the national security state. Why do you stay in it? And why then, why, it sounds to me like you could have had other opportunities to blow the whistle that might have put you in the same predicament. Now you do, but you Yeah, but this is different. Why? You know, though the earlier ones were, you know, you're talking about just fraud and waste. This is a whole different matter. This is actual violations of the Constitution. Willful, deliberate violations. Meaning mass surveillance. Mass surveillance. Remember, I was on the very program in which we were helping the FBI. I one one myself and a colleague. We right after 9/11, we were we were tasked and all approved to help put together the affidavit information would go up before the secret court. That was the secret court called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. 
under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, passed in 1978 under the Carter administration, which in itself was a compromise. This is the means by which, in secret, although you still have, you still have to meet Fourth Amendment probable cause thresholds to, to issue a warrant, although there were a hot pursuit where you actually could uh, pursue if the threat was that, that great, and the, but you still go back to the court for the warrant completely bypassing it. We were taken off that effort. When I confronted uh, Marie McGinsey, she said they've gone with a different program. I knew when she told me that, this is in the first few weeks after 9-11, that we were way across the Rubicon. We were in a whole, we were in a whole new vehicle. It wasn't just the wheels came off. We are in a whole new vehicle I did not recognize. It was an alien form of government. I didn't take the oath to defend an alien form of government. And you think it gets created whole cloth just after 9-11? No. There's no pre-thinking here? No, this goes all the way back to 1947. I could, I could point to 47 as, as the epigenesis of the national security state. So this is taking advantage of crises to establish things sure that is. have been worked out. Yes. And I'm well aware of other things that have you know, happened in terms of emergency orders in case of national crises. Right? For example? COG, you know, continuity of government. I'm well, I'm well aware of, of mechanisms that have been in place even during the Cold War, Continuity which government essentially would establish martial law, would establish a virtual martial law, yeah, and real martial law if necessary. This is all, the, all of this thinking, concept, not just conceptual, but all the planning, the mindset, the view was already in place. And isn't that kind of the whole point about how these people view the Constitution, that the Constitution can essentially be suspended whenever it's pragmatic That's to do so? And you just remember, I'm witnessing in secret the subversion of the Constitution. So what does that mean? They're setting it aside. So how come you're working with all your colleagues. How come you stick your neck out at this moment when it becomes so overt? It's been going on for years, and most people are saying to themselves, it's been going on for years. Why should I stick my neck out? This is all, the, this is all kind of going on during the Cold War. This is kind of just at a new scale. It's not brand new. But you, you stick your neck out and you say, no. Why? I owe it to the people. I took the oath. I wasn't going to break, break the oath that I took. The oath mattered to me. It was the fourth time I had taken it. It mattered. And here's the president committing high crimes and misdemeanors, as defined by the Constitution. And, and, and how did it feel? Suspending the Constitution because we had failed to provide under the preamble, the common defense, suspending the Constitution for all intents and purposes, willfully and deliberately. So the only thing left that I have is defend it. So I decided to keep defending it from within until I no longer could. That's when I went outside the system. And that's what got me in trouble. And how did it feel that the president who got elected next, who was supposed to be the anti-Bush, is the one, President Obama, who actually is the one that targets you. <laughs> Obama knew about my case personally. Okay, I know that for a fact because he was confronted uh, in the Oval Office when he was given a transparency award in secret. And everybody who was there, and I was, it was related to me, his body language said everything, where he actually leaned forward on the edge of his chair basically saying we just can't have these kind of leaks. You know. Can't damage NAS security in the United States. NAS security, as I have said, is the secret religion of the state. You don't question it. We'll excommunicate you. You can't be president in question. That's not right. In, not and live. <laughs> well, you know, that's a pretty strong statement you make. But he was given a silver platter in secret with all the goodies of presidential power. And if you're the new president and you look at that platter, you're not gonna put it back in the drawer. You're gonna keep it, right, out for use if you need to. Why would you take off the platter, the presidential power platter? Why would you take those items off? You know, you're the president after all. Well. Let's look at the other side of this. Here's what Michael Hayden said. 
somebody would come up to me and say, look, Hayden, here's the thing. This Snowden thing is going to be a nightmare for you guys for about two years. And when you get all done with it, what you're going to be required to do is that little 215 program about American tele telephony metadata. And by the way, you can still have access to it, but you've got to go to the court and get access to it from the companies rather than keep it yourself. I go, and this is it after two years? Cool. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean... Do you think he was actually acting for a foreign government? I... When I so intelligence officers answer questions like that using inductive reasoning. I hope we, so. We go to no, no, yeah. not, not information. We, well, we not go in, to not we, intelligence. We go to data, yeah, yeah. and then we're supposed to draw generalized conclusions from data. And I got no inductive trail that tells me Snowden was was helped. On the other hand, if I go deductive on you, which is this is what he did, how do I best explain it? I got my suspicions, but I'm not a deductive guy. I'm an inductive guy by profession, and therefore, I have no evidence. But they're, they're arguing the reason they're doing it is because there's real threats out there. That's an end justifies a means. That's Machiavelli. We're doing this for your own good. Stand aside. We're the, we're the authority. We have the power. You don't. So That's if, not a constitutional republic. Well, I think they would argue, if they were being honest, that you can't have a constitutional republic and defend the United States against its threats. That's the, that that means, really is the that, argument. That means that they consider the Constitution a suicide pact. Or a convenient thing to have out there when you need it. Well, you've got to keep the masses, you know, some would say the sheeple, right, in, in, in line. And so, yes, we have the convenient veneer of a constitution under which we all, quote unquote, take an oath to support and defend, including Michael V. Hayden when he was a general and when he was director of CIA as a civilian, when he retired as a four star. But all that doesn't matter. There are we have an existential crisis. As I was told, you don't understand, Mr. Drake. Exigent conditions apply. Emergency action is necessary to deal with the threat. It doesn't matter that we failed to protect people, protect the nation. We did not keep people out of harm's way. And that whole national security state apparatus put into place formally in 1947 in the Cold War just got transmuted into the 21st century with a new existential threat. And it was gonna be decades, if not longer, that we would have to deal with it. And, and is it possible to have or be the global hegemon? Is it possible to have the kind of foreign policy where there's military bases all over the world? Is it possible to have all the extra economic advantage that global military power gives you and still have a constitutional republic at home? No because the chickens always come home to roost. The same, the very policy mechanism you apply in foreign adventures will come home to roost. The irony, of course, for me, is that the United States became the petri dish for mass surveillance. That's what I became eyewitness to. That was exported overseas, as if mass surveillance was the answer. Remember, mass surveillance has far, far less, less to do with protecting people than it does to drive national security interests and protect national security interests. And how do you define national, or how do they define national security interests? National security interests is what they define based on what needs to be protected for those who are in power and to protect the policies that they implement. It has far less to do with liberty and, and real security. When I asked Larry Wilkerson this, and a somewhat similar story in many ways. You know, someone who you know, joined the armed forces to fight in Vietnam, was in the Bush administration, and got completely disillusioned by it all. Um, his answer was, you know, in the final analysis, what kind of shook him is how banal the interest is in the end, because it's actually about money. It's actually, really I, could, I could make a very powerful economic argument to the whole, this whole thing is just an enterprise. It makes a whole people a whole lot of money because that's partly what I was more than eyewitness to. Look, when I was going around, just giving an example, right after 9-11, the workforce knew we had failed the nation. People really took it hard. 
because that was our responsibility, was to provide the common events. We hadn't done that. So three, almost 3,000 people are murdered. So we're going around the campus. I'm with Marie McGinsky. Guess what she, how is she Liz. explaining it? Marie McGinsky, the signals intelligence director, the person I reported to. Going around, very visible person because it's the largest organization at NSA by far. It's the offensive side of NSA, not the defensive side. You know, it's, it's, it's the core mission of NSA. And her explanation is that NSA was a gift. 9-11 was a gift to NSA. And then she said, we'll get all the money we want and then some. It was clear that this was not just a fa the failure was now going to result in all kinds of money. And that's why during the 50th anniversary of NSA, which it took place in the fall of 2002, and I was there, I remember Hayden up on the dais receiving this big check, like the fake check publisher's clearinghouse, right, that they used to have, and they made a big deal of it with the cameras rolling. You know, I, oh, wow, you won a million dollars. Let's just say there was a number, right? It was in the billions. And it was the then, one of the then house staff managers, his name was Tim Sample, who was handing this check over to Hayden. And I clearly remember, although I could not hear the words, but it was clear just from his, I do, can sort of lip read, he was looking down at George Tennant, then pointing to the check, looking back to George, I said, George, I got my money, George, I got my money. I got my money. Look, if you're at NSA and you're, you're going to get all the money you want and then some. You really are. Billions and billions were poured. Not just NSA, but throughout. CIA, FBI, you name it. This became a huge jobs program. I mean, the quickest way to become a millionaire was to you know, start a small company, as many of my colleagues did. Hire five or six people, you're an instant millionaire. Because you can sell these services to the NSA. Yeah, and you can re replicate them with the other agencies. Okay, in the next segment of our interview, we'll talk about the controversy over what kind of program to use. But it's one, of, it's one of the big elephants in the room. Look, I mean, you know, this, you say war crisis profiteers. Why? What the heck? I'm not going to let this go to waste. And it doesn't matter that it's a national treasure of the United States. It doesn't matter if it's American taxpayer money. And of course, this all, most, of, most all of this was being def deficit funded anyways. And doesn't, doesn't matter. This is for national security. We're going to get what we want. And it doesn't matter. This was really all preparation for the invasion of Iraq that might have cost a million Iraqis lives. The truth be told, they were looking for an excuse to invade Iraq before 9-11. They had it. That was the real priority in terms of what we would do militarily overseas. From day one. Yes, from day the, the one. The Bush administration. Right. Other people forget as well is that NSA was circulating during the presidential transition team period, the PTT, Bush is elected, Clinton is still, well, he's president-elect, but he's not the president yet. He has not taken the oath. There was a memo that was circulated by NSA seeking relief on the probable cause standard of the Fourth Amendment. They are looking for ways to erode it significantly. So if your highest foreign policy priority in reality from the very beginning is the evasion of Iraq, then it's not a big surprise you deprioritize terrorism because, heck, wouldn't that be a nice excuse for yes. what our number one priority is? And then conveniently link it, which was, a, which was of course, completely framed, that Iraq had something to do with 9-11. Yeah, had absolutely that's... nothing to do with 9-11. Okay, we're going to continue this sure. discussion. Please join us for the continuation of Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network.